then we can start. <coughs> oh, okay. All right, so welcome everyone to our session. This is related to quasi-experimental design. Uh, Dr. Brian Sloboda is uh, sharing um, his materials uh, with us. And I see, Brian, your screen is done somehow. Uh, can you share again uh -huh. your screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Nothing to know now. Okay, all right. I guess we're ready to begin now. Yes, Brian, go ahead and start. Uh, welcome to the quasi experimental design. So, and um, I will go through this and just giving you a, a discussion and hints of is the quasi-experimental design, so that way you can be able to apply it. So basically the objective of this this webinar is to explain what quasi-experimental research is and how it differs from both experimental and correlational research. And then from this, you want to be able to describe some of the research design associated with quasi-experimental, such as non-equivalent groups, pre-test, post-test, and interrupted time series. And then we'll give a little hint of examples of each. That way you have a flavor of what to expect. <coughs> so what is quasi-experimental design? So that's going to be the first part of it. So what do we mean by quasi-experimental design? Well, earlier, back in about a few weeks ago, I did a presentation or webinar on the experimental design. And if you recall that experimental design is characterized by complete random assignment of groups or subjects. And then the groups would be independent and that it usually employs some strong control for comparison purposes. But, so we have to kind of look at the word that the prefix a little bit of quasi. And <coughs> so what do we mean by quasi? It means resembling. So as we can see, Quasi-experimental means that it's resembling experimental. So it's not really experimental per se, but it's somewhat like it, but not completely. Right. Brian, uh, we're not seeing the slides. Could you advance them, please? Um, yes, Brian, we just see the very first slide. Oh. So you see the first slide. Only the, yes, can you cl click on to move to the next slide? <laughs> All I do is down arrow, got the page down. I guess that doesn't work. How about that? Uh, no, it's not moving. Brian, uh, you can email me your slides and I can share the screen and move it for you if it's not working from your side. Uh, okay. Okay, it should be there in another second or two. Okay, okay. I... I haven't got it yet, Brian. Uh, 
It should be on its way. Okay. As soon as I get it, I'll, I'll share it, but it's not here yet. is not here yet Brian. <laughs> so yes, it is. i sent it i know i don't know why it's not that we are waiting and talk about the materials till I get it. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Sorry about this like. So go ahead and share your screen, Brian. Uh, I, for some reason it's not here yet. So Maybe. I, I, am, yeah. I have a new screen up called Decision-Based Learning. Does everyone see that? Yes, 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 we can see it. Okay. Oh, okay, good. And then um so now I took I took this information and put it into the developer to kind of get a good flavor of how you would be able to apply or use quasi experimental design. What is so I start off here, what is the most appropriate design for your research? So do you have do you have a uh, experimental perhaps or is it going to be um oops. so how do you decide and then um so it goes back to the experimental design that i covered on may 16 2019 and remember the whole idea of experimental design is complete a random assignment of groups or subjects, and then the groups are going to be independent. And as I stated earlier, it also employs strong control. And then, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the quasi-experimental design, you know, we're, you know, we have broad distinctions. We're looking at between subjects. In other words, dependent measures taken one at a time and their data are independent, not correlated. 
And then within subjects, it's going to be some type of repeating measures design. And it takes it multiple times. And then the data may often be dependent. And then there's going to be mix. So how do you know which to use? Well, you, have, you may have no decision. And then you might have no decision questions as well. Um, So when you're so when you're doing it's quasi experimental, you have to kind of think about what the research question is going to be. So if you have experimental design versus quasi experimental design, what are you how are you going to achieve that? So that becomes the question, where you, how do you know when to do what? So that's what brings us back to the, um, the word quasi. Quasi means resembling. So in other words, it's not a complete experimental design as <coughs> we would have. So I'm back into the PowerPoint presentation. So does everyone see my PowerPoint? Mm, you so, still see the DBL actually, but but I got your okay. Go ahead and I got your uh, slides as well, did, Brian. But uh, go okay. ahead and switch. Yeah. Go ahead and switch. Okay. So, so everyone see my uh, PowerPoint now? <coughs> yes, we can see. Oh, okay. So, what is the design? So, I kind of showed you a little bit of it in BL, in a limited framework, and it shows you the different approaches that you can use for quasi experimental. But by like any study, including quasi-experimental, the first part is going to create some quasi-experimental design and knowing what your variables are. <coughs> so the predicted variable is the dependent variable, which we all know would be the y variable or dependent. So the quasi-independent variable would be the x variable. So that's going to be the variable that's manipulated as a means to affect the dependent variable. So you can have the x variables generally some type of grouping variable with different levels in, in this approach. So the grouping means that there's going to be two or more groups, such as two groups receiving maybe alternative treatments, and a treatment group and a no treatment group. So in other words, you might give a group a placebo, for example, which is commonly used in medical <coughs> and physiological experiments. And then you can look, so another way to do um, quasi-experimental design is using a time series approach. Look, at, you throw in some treatment, and then you see what the impacts is going to have, and then you can look at that at that way. So Brian, sorry, can you move to the next slide? Because we are still seeing, yeah. seeing. Are you moving to the next slide? Yes, I already did. I just did it right now. So we, the we title of the slide. Yeah, we don't see. Subject. So what we see is the slide that it says broad distinctions. So we only see that one. So I, I did it. So is it assigning subjects to groups? See that slide? No. So let me share my screen because now I got it, so I can share. Hold on. Oh, okay. Okay. Can you see it now? This is like what, yes, I what can. is it? Okay. 
Now this one. Yeah, the ex we call the experimental design. Yes. Right. Right. <coughs> Thank you. So let's move to the next slide. And okay, we were here, I guess, when you were talking about. Yeah, we did that. That's done. And then the next one. Here we go. You're here, right? Definition of variable. Uh, now, this is. Yeah, we should. So the definition of the variable. So the first part that you would have to do first is identify your variable. So you have to look for your y variable, which is dependent variable. And then what are going to be your independent variable? Because you want to manipulate the independent variable to get to your, to impact your y variable. And then so, so you can also group your independent variables. So they can receive alternative treatments or whatever it might be. It might be like a placebo like that they do in medical and physiological research. And then another common thing that's done in quasi-experimental design is you have a time theory and you implement some change. And then when you implement that change, you see what happens in the time series. And then that's how, that's another approach. I'll kind of mention that a little bit more later. Uh, next slide. So you want to assign subjects to groups. So in an experiment, some random assignment, study units will have a chance of being assigned to some given treatment. So as such, this random treatment gives both the experimental and the control groups that could be equivalent. So the assignment to some treatment group is based on something other than some random assignment, like we saw in experimental design. Depending upon the research type of experimental, quasi-experimental design, the researcher might have control over the assignment to some treatment condition, but they might have some criteria other than some random assignment. So in other words, they might say, okay, we're looking at test score, but we're going to say arbitrarily, this is going to be the cutoff for the next test score. Then the two participants will receive some form of treatment over that. And then the researcher has no control over that treatment assignment, and the criteria used for that assignment could be unknown. So in other words, they might say <coughs> the cutoff is going to be at 70, but they may not know that before the start of the experiment. But something prompts them to say that's going to be the cutoff score as given. Uh, next slide. And Quasi experiments are also effective because they can use the pre post testing. So, this means their tests are done before any data are collected. You know, they want to know if there's any person compound or if some participants might have some particular tendencies. Then, so the actual experiment will be done, and then you can look at what are the effects on the post test. And then the data can be compared to, as part of the study test, and you can see what actually occurred and kind of draw some conclusions on that. But quasi experiments have uh, variables that already exist. You know, there were the age of the person, their gender, eye color, whatever characteristics that might be. And then these characteristics can either be continuous or even categorical, such as gender. So, so even though you have that, some this will be exact during the quasi experiment. Oh, next slide. But one of the big things you have to worry about is going to be internal and external validity. So internal validity is the approximate truth about influences regarding cause and effect or causal relationships. In other words, in plain English. Given there's a relationship between the independent variables and dependent variable, is it likely that the former caused the latter? That's what you want to know. So when you're doing quasi-experimental design, the thing you have to worry about is going to be internal validity. So you have to be, make sure 
you know what is causing what, or looking at cause what caused what. But what can threaten internal validity? Something could happen, and I'm not talking, reg you know, regression statistical analysis, but something that would cause something to regress over time. <coughs> that could affect internal validity. And history and the participants, too. That could also occur. You're looking at things like, um, and then you're assigning people to groups, and then you might be looking at different levels of education, age, and so on. So you want to know, did, did the wages actually caused by the education level, the gender level, and so on? So did it actually cause that? And then um, typically you will say yes, but if you put in some of uh, perhaps the wrong types of variables or not a strong variable, it may cause it to do something else. So, okay, very good. Okay. Oh, next. Oh, next slide. But, but there's different types of design. So, quasi experimental, and as I, we all know, we only get an hour to do this. So once you only have an hour to do this, I can't cover every single aspect of quasi-experimental. I kind of just pick and choose things that might be interesting that we might be coming across. So you sometimes you can do like differences and differences estimator, which will be like a pre and post without comparison. Uh, so like different and difference estimators would be such things like a nice simple example would be, oh, if you were a uh, educator and you want to know if it's going to be a new teaching method and you want to test it to see how well students perform on a standardized test. So the, so the difference that would be the pre would be before they took the test, before they took that um, educational approach. And then the post, and then you can make some comparisons using a DID estimator. Um, so, so non-responding control group design. So there's no treatment control group design. There's um non-equivalent dependent variable designs. There's repeated treatment designs. There's cohort design, post-only design. So you. And another very common approach for quasi experimental is regression continuity design. I think that's probably a kind of a more popular method that's used. Um, so, and I just mentioned this a second ago regression discontinuity design, but before that, it was continuity. And then there's case control designs, and then there's something like panel analysis that you can look at too. So when you have case control design, for example, it's more like time series. I kind of mentioned it already, a multiple time series. So you can do it that way. Or instrumental variables is another example. So there's tons of different approaches that you can take with quasi-experimental. Oh, next slide. Okay. 
So, so Brian, can you tell us the difference between regression continuity design and regression discontinuity design? Well, um, the regression continuity design, uh, well, I think I'm trying to think of a good example on that. So, off the top of my head. So when you have regression continuity design, basically what you're trying to do is when um, you're trying to find an approach between the variables, uh, um, how it could be done. So it's a quasi-experimental pretest post uh, test. And basically when you're talking about regression continuity and discontinuity, basically what you're doing is, hey, here is a task that we gave and then looking at the effects of these interventions by looking at the test scores above or below before the intervention was actually designed. And then um, so it's kind of like uh, and we regression continuity, that's the, probably more about the discontinuity, but when you're looking at the continuity, you're, it's not looking at the test scores completely or not a complete cutoff. But the discontinuity, you say you chop it off at some point and then you look at the effects. But mainly, I think in a quasi experimental design, the regression discontinuity is probably the more popular approach to take. You don't really see too much on the, the continuity approach. Okay. Oh, next slide. So when you have non-equipment participants in a between group subject randomly assigned to condition, so the resulting groups are likely to be similar. So we may even consider them to be equivalent. So when participants are not randomly assigned, the resulting group would still be dissimilar in other ways. So in other words, if you're looking in a classroom, oh, I'm gonna give an example now. Next slide. I forgot what I was giving on. So for this reason, researchers consider them to be non-equivalent. So what happens is this design is between subjects in which the participants have not been randomly assigned to some criteria. So they appear to be equivalent, but they're really not. So next slide. So Here's my example. <coughs> so a researcher who wants to evaluate a new method of teaching fractions to third graders. So one way is to conduct a study with a treatment group, one class of third grader, the control group consisting of another third group class. So you have, you have to kind of, you need to kind of control group for this. So next slide. This would be non-equivalent group design because the students are not randomly assigned to class. So there could be important differences between the students in these classes. So if you have, if you're testing two third grade classes, one class might be Miss Babs third grade class, and then a control group could be Mr. Henry's third grade class. So you're already testing the students in Ms. Babb's class and Mr. Henry's class is the control group. So they're already in those assigned groups. However, what, there could be a, an issue with that <coughs> because parents of higher achieving or more motivated students might be more likely to request that their children be assigned to the higher achieving class. They might say, oh, the students in Ms. Babb's class are much better. I want my child, maybe he's in Mr. Henry's class, to go over to Ms. Babb's class. So that's kind of experimental design. That's kind of like almost not experimental. But anyway, next slide. So, or the principal may have to assign the troublemakers to another class and the teacher is maybe a strong disciplinarian. So the principal could decide to reallocate. 
the students because he doesn't like some of these people in this bad class so he puts them somewhere else and he wants these students in this one class be in another group so he could do that and we all know that the teacher's style even the classroom environment might be different and um, that would have an impact on the levels of achievement or motivation among the students so we kind of know that every teacher has their own different way of doing things. Oh, next slide. So, the end of the study, there's a difference between the two classes learning fraction. It might be caused by the teaching method, but it could be also occurring by confounding variables that we can look at. So, but when you're using it as a pro, you want to make sure the groups are as similar as possible. Because if you want to know one group and another group are learning fraction, you want to be able to make that determination whether that method in learning fraction was effective. So, oh, next slide. <coughs> well, the researcher could just select two classes in the same school. But at the same time, the two students in two classes have similar scores on the math test. The teachers will probably have to be very similar, close in age, have similar teaching style. So by doing this, you will improve the internal validity of the study because you don't have to worry about whether there were any discrepancies or if there's any confounding issues that are coming into play. So this type of design, when you have the teachers that are the same, similar teaching styles and so on, that helps maintain the internal validity. Oh, next slide. So the next common one is the pre-test and post-test. So the dependent variable is measured once before the treatment and after. So, so a common example, I have an example for this, a researcher who's interacted the effectiveness of some anti-drug education program on elementary school students' attitude towards drugs. So, oh, next slide. So, Brian, there is a question here, if you want to answer. Uh, she's asking one of the... approach because each participant is tested under the control condition and then under the treatment condition about in terms of looking at the attitude towards anti-drug programs. Oh next slide. If the average post-test score is better than the average pre-test score, we conclude that the treatment might be responsible for the improvement in the attitude. However, you have to be careful when you say that because you can't conclude this with total accuracy because there could be other explanations so that we weren't aware of that could be anecdotal to make some conclusion like that. So we don't know just because the test score is higher or improvement, we can't sit and say that. So the next slide. So 
one category of explanation would be the history. So what are the things that could have happened between the pre-test and the post-test that could influence scores? So for example, the students that have watched an anti-drug program aired on television, and many of the students saw that, per that program. Then another thing, a common example would be that a famous person died of a drug overdose, and many of the students heard about it. So those types of events could have an impact on their attitudes towards drug use. Oh, next, next slide. So another case would be the maturation. So participants sort of change between the two pre-test and post-test. Well, because typically between the pre and the post, what may happen is grow and you learn. So if you do, that could impact the scores as well. So if this was a year long program, the students might be less impulsive or better reasoners. And this might be responsible for their change in the responses maybe. So it depends how long this whole entire thing could last. Oh, next slide. So another is to look at the regression to the mean. I'm not talking about the X and Y changing kind of regression, but individuals who scored extremely high and a variable at one time might score less on the next next time. <coughs> oh, next slide. So I'll give an example of that. So let's suppose that you are a bowler and your long-term average is 170, but all of a sudden you just got better and you decided to bowl and that one game 210. But you normally don't do 210. So your score will regress back to 170 eventually. So after your 210, your next score might be 172. So what happens is you got to be careful of these extremes in scores because <coughs> those will have an impact on your final results. Oh, next slide. <coughs> but it's unlike within a subject experiment in that the order of conditions is not counterbalanced. So the person could be tested one time, but then it doesn't come back again. And then so basically what's going to happen is it's possible to be tested in the treatment condition first, and then you might get untreated control condition after that. So next slide. So that's the pre and post test. You can see there's some anomalies that you have to worry about when you're looking at pre and post tests too. <coughs> and that's what you have to be careful of and looking at the extremities in the score. So for an interrupted time series design, this is common. So it's a time series that's interrupted by said treatment. So you may be looking uh, at some score and then apply some treatment and then you look at it afterwards. So I'll give an example of it next. Uh, next slide. This is taken from Cook and Campbell, 1979. So you want to look at the treatment was the reduction of work shifts in factories from 10 hours to eight hours. So because productivity increased rather quickly after the shortening of the work shifts, it elevated for many months, it remained elevated for many months after that. So what happened to productivity? Well, by reducing the amount of work hours, it caused an increase in productivity. So, so reducing the, the, the hours of the shift was your treatment, and then you wanted to look to see how productivity changed over time after that. <clears throat> that would be an interrupted time series because you're looking at one treatment before the reduction in work hours versus to be ducking in the work hour. Uh, oh, next slide. So 
So, so if you notice that the time series design, this interrupted time series design, it's almost similar to a pre-test, post-test, because you're looking at the measurements of the dependent variable, both before and after the treatment. So it's unlike post-design, and that includes multiple pre-test and post-test measurements. So it's not necessarily you're just doing it one time. You may be doing it several times as well. <coughs> so I have a plot on the next page of the variables. Oh, next. So another example is, um, here's another example of interrupted time series. So next slide. So I was looking at the treatment effects here. Oh, oh can you go? So I have the treatment effects here. I can plot. And then be on the top part, and then the bottom part. And then we'll look at to see, OK, when we intervene, what's going to happen? Next slide. This shows data from a hypothetical interrupted time series study. So the dependent variable is the number of student absence, absences per week in the research. So the treatment is that the instructor begins public taking attending each class period. <coughs> so the students know who, that the instructor is aware who's present and who is absent from the course. So that that will have this because it's public and students will know who's there and who's not, and the instructor will know it will have an impact on the number of student absences. Next slide. So the top panel that, that I showed slides ago, is the treatment actually worked. So when you expect attendance to be taken, you would notice that the absences decline. If you remember in that there's a high number of absences before treatment, and there's an immediate and sustained drop in absences after the treatment. And the bottom panel, as I, if you may recall, shows that what might occur if the treatment did not work. <coughs> so on average, the number of absences after the treatment is going to be about the same as the number before in the bottom panel. So sometimes interrupted time series design doesn't always give us the result that we intend to think of what occur. Oh, next slide. And then there's a case report. So when you have the case report, this is kind of a qualitative approach to um, quasi-experimental design because it's often used in a narrative format could be experimental or not experimental. You could develop a profile of the subject when I look in some visual observation. You can use interview, survey, and questionnaire, objective data. Then you can provide things like generalizations about other subjects, perhaps with similar condition. Oh, next slide. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, basically you have to think about which how it's going to impact your internal and external validity because you're not you're not you're not being able to experimental design. Quasi experimental design are an actual experiment that could be applied to different subjects and you can find some general issues that could also be made as well. And I, the most the common approach is this approach is really good if you have longer time periods and you can look at different things over time. And then the advantage is, is that it's going to have any population that you could be able to choose if necessary compared to uh, an actual experiment. So in actual experiment, you have to let the actual manipulation occur but you don't have any control over the experimental design. So it's not like you assign people to go or not applying any kind of randomness. I'm sure you don't have that. Oh, next slide. 
quasi experiment kind of look you know gotta worry about the confounding variable then you also have to work with the issues of quality so an example here is that a variation in your response to when children get spanked it could be it may not be able to be measured completely but it could be the measurement by your wellness of the parents, irritability, and so on. All those factors would come into play. Then also, too, the lack of random assignment is all prevalent here. So that could influence the internal validity of, of, the, of this all. So even if the threats of internal validity are assessed, you still can't assume, you can't state Causality. One causes another. So you still have, you still can't make that causality thing. And also the disadvantages include study groups could provide some type of weaker evidence because of a lack of randomness. So when you're not having that lack of randomness, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Oh, next slide. <coughs> oh. And that brings us to the end of the session, and we have 12 minutes for questions. Uh, I'll open any questions you might have. Okay. If there is any question, um, thank you, please. You may want to type your question, or um, uh, let me. I think the lines are unmuted now. You can talk. Okay, any questions? So there's a question, Brian. Can you talk, Brian? Because uh, I think your line is muted. I don't see. Okay. Yeah, I, I can click on it. Okay. So there's a question uh, asked for, do you have an example of a dissertation based on quasi-experimental des design? Um, I saw one dissertation that kind of dealt with um, the examination. I kind of use this example here, where we were looking at the scores of students using fraction in the third grade class. I kind of simplified it a little bit more to illustrate. So, if you were looking at Miss Bass' third grade class, Mr. Henry's class, and then you want to know how students improved when they learn this new teaching method for fraction. I hope that kind of helps a little bit. <coughs> mm -hmm. And also, too, I want to make a, a little clarification. Someone asked earlier about causal comparative design. It's, keep in mind, causal comparative design also means quasi-experimental design. There's like two different names. So there are two different names for the same thing. So quasi-experimental design would sometimes be referred to as causal comparative. I see someone typing questions, so. Right. So Brian, can you tell us, um,
Brian, do you have any recommendation for chairs uh, um, if they want to um, mentor students using quasi-experimental? What are the particular issues that they need to keep in mind when they are supervising their students? Well, they have to be worried about exactly where the data comes from. How is the data going to be collected? You got to think about the internal and external validity issue. And then you got to think about, okay, I am doing this quasi-experimental design. What method, what approach within quasi-experimental design am I going to use and why? Okay. Okay. All right, and do you, uh, I see that you had some uh, resources. Is there any particular resource that you can suggest for 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 everyone to use for quasi-experimental design? In, in, in um, that 1979 book that I have here that I mentioned, I think that's a good first step. It's not a hard thing to learn. So if you have that book, that would be great. Okay. You can go on Amazon and get a nice, cheap copy. Okay. Very good. So, any other questions before we finish? <coughs> oh, is it possible to share your PowerPoint uh, within an email? Um, I think, yes, it is possible. Um, we have a recording of the session posted um, to our site, and I think. Um, Dr. Paladino can share the copy of these slides. Yeah. If you have any other questions that, that you might have, you can contact me at that at my email address too. All right. So if there is no more questions, uh, we may wrap up the session. Um, thank you, Brian, for the presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, we had some technical issues at the beginning. Um, thanks for being patient with us. And then also, I wish I could have done a little bit more on quasi-experimental, but I only get one hour. So sorry if that. Right, right. We understand. OK. All right, everyone, so have a great evening, and thank you for attending. <coughs> yep. Have a good night, everyone. All right. Thank you. Take care, Brian. Oh, you too. See you Monday at KWB. Yes. So, everyone, make sure to attend KWB. Uh, you know that we have a conference coming up starting Monday. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, Michelle wants to say something. Michelle, is she here or she left? She raised her hand. Uh, I think she left already. Yeah, it looks like she left. Yeah. All right, then. So see you, everyone, on, in KWB, as Brian mentioned, Monday morning. Take care and have a great uh -huh. evening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye.
By the way, did you have a look at those things I sent you? Yeah. Yeah, but I didn't get to I didn't get to sit down and like write write on them.